Hi, it's Kelly Thorngore. <clears throat> let's try take number two. I lost internet connection there for a moment. So let's try this again. I am so glad you are joining me for this 40 day prayer challenge. We are going through the book, Draw the Circle. And again, I'm Kelly Thorne Gore. I'm a life and a business coach, and I'm passionate about helping women create a life they love because that then ripples into their marriage and their family and all they get to impact. Today is one of my favorite topics in Draw the Circle. It's about shameless audacity. And years ago, I heard a sermon from Andy Stanley, the pastor of North Point Church, on this very topic, and it was so revolutionary in my business and in my life and how I was praying and what I was expecting of God. Unfortunately, I can't find that video anymore. I'm going to keep looking. Hopefully, I can share it with you. I've been looking for a while because I wanted to rewatch it. It is so great. Um, if you want to go on a Googling search, it's Andy Stanley. The title of the message was Asking Big. And it ties in so much with this shameless audacity. Good morning, Kim. So happy to see you. So let's talk about this. What does shameless audacity mean and how does it tie into prayer? So I want to start. He kind of alludes to... Um, Luke chapter 11, but I want to dig into it and I want to share with you some of the context things that I learned from Andy Stanley years and years ago. So let me read the passage to you first, and I'm going to read it for, to you from the message version because that's where I have my notes. So it says, um, this is Luke chapter 11. One day he was praying in a certain place and when he finished, so this was Jesus, he was praying. When he finished, one of his disciples said, Pastor, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And so he said, when you pray, say, and you guys know the Lord's Prayer. So this is going to sound different in the message version, but I want you to hear it a little bit different today. So it says, Father, reveal who you are. Set the world right. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and from the devil. Then it says, then he said, imagine what would happen if you went to a friend in the middle of the night and said, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. An old friend traveling through just showed up. I don't have a thing on hand. The friend answers from his bed. Don't bother me. The door's locked. My children are all down for the night and I can't get up and give you anything. Okay, so every parent right now knows this. Like when your kids are sleeping, you don't want anybody showing up at the door. You don't want any commotion or making noise. You want it quiet, right? Okay, but listen to what happens. It says, um, but let me tell you, even if he won't get up because he's a friend, if you stand your ground, knocking and waking all the neighbors, he'll finally get up and give you whatever you need. Here's what I'm saying. Ask and you'll get. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open. Don't bargain with God. Be direct and ask for what you need. I love this passage. So, one of the things about the context of this, of just us getting the mental imagery of what Jesus meant when he shared this parable, is that back in these times, they would have been in a one room home or everyone would have been sleeping in the same room. And the children from youngest to oldest would sleep closest to the door. So the youngest would be closest to the door and then it would go all the way back to the parents at the other end of this one room. And so it gives you the context of like, okay, the door's locked, probably in a pretty fancy way locked because, you know, they didn't have locks like we have now. And the dad is all the way on the other side of this and he would have to wake and disrupt all of the kids. And so just kind of have that in your mind as you're thinking of this parable. The other thing about a parable 
is that when we look at a parable, there are always references to different people in the parable. So one, we have to find where God is. And in this particular parable, God is represented of the father, um, the dad, the one who is being asked for the bread. And so then we think, okay, well, why wouldn't God just give him what he needed at the first request? And then we have to look for, okay, well, where are we in the parable? And we are the one asking. And so this is a perfect representation of prayer and really of that shameless audacity. Because I think sometimes God wants to see, are we going to keep asking? Are we going to just say the prayer and be fleeting and on to the next thing? Or do we really want it? Is that really a desire of our heart? And so I love the reminder in this verse that we have to ask and we have to keep seeking and we have to keep knocking and we have to keep showing up. And I think that's a perfect illustration with the circling of prayer because we're circling we're praying fervently. We're asking God. We're believing him to do something that only he could do. Okay, let's dig into a couple of the quotes from the book that I absolutely love. So <clears throat> one of them is the risk of prayer, the, or excuse me, that is the risk of prayer, isn't it? But if we don't ask, we'll never know. We accumulate lots of wouldas, couldas, shouldas. And here's what I know for sure. God won't answer 100% of the prayers. We don't pray. We got to pray. We got to ask. We got to seek. We got to knock. We got to keep coming back to him. And I love this next part. It says, why do we mistakenly think that God is offended by our prayers for the impossible? The truth is that God is offended by anything less. God is offended when we ask him to do things we can do ourselves. It's the impossible prayers that honor God because they reveal our faith and they allow God to reveal his glory. And I think that is the key of the asking, the seeking, and the knocking. It reveals our faith. Do we really believe that God's going to do it enough to keep asking and seeking and knocking. Okay, I love to. The beauty of obedience is this. It reveals, or excuse me, it relieves us of a responsibility. I love this. It takes all the pressure off of us and it places it squarely on God's sovereign shoulders. When we give God the tithe, for example, our finances are no longer our responsibility. They become God's responsibility. And the more we give away, the more we can enjoy and the more we can keep. Sometimes we're afraid of praying for miracles because we're afraid that God won't answer. But that means the answer's up to us, right? So we're afraid to ask because we're afraid God's not going to answer or he's not going to give us what we want or what we desire. But that's not really the focus of prayer because the answer isn't up to us. It's our, it isn't our job to answer. It's our job to ask. And Jesus exhorts us to ask. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be given to you. These three words, ask, seek, and knock, are present. In other words, they aren't something we do once. They are actions that we repeat over and over again. So we've got to keep asking and we've got to keep seeking and we've got to keep knocking and we might need to keep praying and circling as well. And then his last thought is, the greatest tragedy in life is the prayers that go unanswered simply because they go unasked. And so this is shameless audacity. It's continuing to come to God. But I also love, it takes the pressure off of us. We ask, we seek, we knock, and then if God chooses to answer it in a different way, 
then we can trust that his timing is good and that his plans and his purpose are for our good, but also for his glory. Okay, so Keisha said, I'm not understanding why God gets offended. Yeah, I don't know, Keisha. So my encouragement to you would be to go to God and to ask him. And that's not just like a flat answer, but like to really seek the heart of God around this. The way I interpret that is more that he's already given us and entrusted to us certain things that we can do on our own, that we don't necessarily need him to do. He's already given us strengths and talents and abilities. And so if we're sitting around and not using those, but praying and asking him to do it, then we don't necessarily need him to do it. He's already equipped us. But there are the big things that we're praying for that only he can show up and do. And so it's exercising that shameless audacity. One thing I will mention too is that, you know, this is from a devotional and it's Mark Batterson's opinion and it's my opinion. And so if you sit with God and God reveals something different to you and you hear that in that still small voice, that he has something for you different, that he wants you to pray or believe or, um, or you see something that lines up with scripture, obviously, then you got to claim that. And so anytime you hear or read a devotional or hear someone speak and you don't necessarily agree with it, take it to God and ask him like, God, is this what you want me to believe? And if not, like, show me what you want me to believe. So I use that as a rhythm for any time I'm reading a book or a resource or I'm hearing someone speak. If it just doesn't sit right with me, take it to God and ask him. All right, shameless audacity. So I want to challenge you to ask big and to keep seeking and to keep knocking and to keep showing God that you're exercising your faith and that you do have shameless audacity that you are believing him for. All right, I hope you have a great Sunday.